Samantha. Uh, some uh, gastroenterology, you're going to get some physiology, some microbiology, and also some animal behavior. So uh, excited about this talk. Great, thank you. Thanks everybody for coming and thanks for having me. Thanks Seth for a great introduction. Um, I'm pulling out all the controls now. We're going wild <laughs> and into the field. Um, so it's gonna be messy, I'll warn you from the beginning. Um, yeah, so today I'm gonna talk to you about some work I've done on the gut microbiota of uh, wild howler monkeys. Um, and so um, as Seth kind of uh, told us about in his talk, uh, gut microbes are found in a wide variety of animals, um, and most of the gut microbes that these animals have uh, tend to be um, either helpful or neutral, even though a lot of the kind of general public thinks of, of microbes as maybe pathogenic, and that's starting to change, thankfully. Um, we also know that a lot of these microbes vary um, across host species, right? So this phyllosymbiosis that Seth was talking about. You see different types of microbes in different hosts. Um, but regardless of the host, a lot of times these microbes are performing functions for the hosts that are beneficial. Um, so we know the most about the nutritional benefits. Gut microbes can break down substances in host diets that are otherwise undigestible by the hosts. Um, so things like structural carbohydrates. Uh, microbes will break those down and produce short-chain fatty acids that can be used by hosts for energy. Um, they can also process uh, toxins such as plant secondary metabolites and can produce things like vitamins as well for the host. So there are a lot of nutritional benefits associated uh, with having these gut microbial communities. We also know gut microbial communities affect host immune function and development um, and factors such as stress response, mood, and behavior. Uh, so these gut microbes are having a huge impact on their host in a variety of ways. Um, and because of these things, uh, a lot of terms, these two terms get thrown around a lot when we're talking about the gut microbiome, especially in mammals. Um, people see this phyllosymbiosis and they immediately say there's coevolution happening. Um, as Seth pointed out, that's not necessarily true. Um, you don't necessarily have coevolution happening just because there's a phyllosymbiosis happening. Um, likewise, because of all the benefits that these microbes provide to their host, people automatically say there's a mutualism happening between these hosts and their gut microbes. Um, and again, that may be true. In fact, I believe both of these things are probably true, but we need to be really careful when we're using these terms because they both imply uh, fitness benefits, either to the host or to the microbes. Um, and in many cases, especially in the mammalian gut microbial communities, uh, we don't necessarily have evidence of these fitness benefits yet um, to hosts or necessarily microbes. Um, in addition to that, a lot of the mammalian studies um, that have happened in the past, this is starting to change thankfully, but um, in the past, uh, have not been looking at wild systems, where arguably the selective pressure is, is most important, where these fitness benefits that microbes could be providing to their hosts are gonna be especially important. So that's what I want to talk about a little bit today, um, looking at how gut microbial communities in hosts that are in the wild uh, could be impacting their fitness. Um, now, spoiler alert, I don't have actual fitness measures for these primates either, um, but I'd like to talk about some factors uh, that these gut microbes may be influencing that are contributing to these fitness uh, potentially. Um, and that factor is plasticity, uh, plasticity in the host. Um, we've known for a long time uh, that the ability of a host to adapt to environmental change uh, is a strong influencer of its fitness. And so in these wild environments, uh, there are variation in a number of factors that, that um, animals inhabiting the environments have to deal with. Uh, so across space and time, you see differences in things like temperature, uh, predation risks, Still going? Okay. Uh, rainfall, food availability, things like fire regimes, crowding, um, other sorts of natural disasters like seismic activity. All of these things are varying in these wild environments and animals are having to deal with those variations. Um, and one of those sorts of variations that there's been a lot of work on in general um, in ecology is looking at variation in food availability and in uh, food intake, as well as organisms' demands for nutrition, other nutritional demands. Um, and that's really what I'm going to focus on today, is looking at this sort of dietary plasticity and changes in host nutritional intake and host nutritional demands um, and how animals are dealing with that. Um, so usually we think about uh, this kind of plasticity in the realm of nutrition using basic bioenergetics models, right? So um, we have uh, an, an animal will ingest food, which it then digests and assimilates the energy and nutrients, which are used for metabolism, growth, and reproduction. This is a basic model. But if you think about it, any one aspect of this model that changes will result in changes in another part of the, of the model. Um, so animals must compensate in some way if there's a change that happens. 
So for example, if you have a decrease in food availability in an environment for some reason, um, you may get animals therefore ingesting less food, um, and as a result, they may be able to put less um, energy and nutrients towards growth and reproduction. There's less growth or reproductive output. Um, activity may be decreased. Or on the other hand, um, animals may increase activity in order to keep those ingestion levels high. They may go search for more food. So there's this kind of back and forth that happens. Uh, likewise, if an individual has increased nutritional demands, uh, perhaps they're growing or reproducing and need more energy or nutrients for that, uh, we're going to expect that individual to potentially ingest more food um, or be less active to compensate for those changes. And I would say the field of ecology has done a really good job um, of looking at these kind of compensa compensatory mechanisms and this back and forth in these sorts of models, especially in the realms of uh, patterns in feeding uh, behavior, as well as changes in patterns of growth, reproduction, and activity. But I would argue one of the areas we still don't know a whole lot about is how digestion and assimilation may be shifting across time and space in response to some of these differences. We do know there are several factors that impact the digestion and assimilation um, in organisms. Um, the first two are gut morphology and the permeability of the epithelial layer in the gut. Um, so larger volume of the gut leads to increased digestive efficiency and larger surface area leads to increased assimilation efficiency. And likewise, the permeability of the epithelial layer is going to affect assimilation efficiency. So more permeability equals more assimilation. And there's evidence that both of these factors will change in response to host nutritional demands in rodents. So increased nutritional demands in rodents um, lead to increased gut size, increased gut volume and surface area. There's less evidence for this sort of mechanism in larger mammals, however. And I would argue that regardless, this is probably an energetically expensive solution uh, to solving these nutritional needs because the gut is one of the most metabolically expensive tissues to produce and maintain. So instead, I want to think about what the gut microbiota might be doing. Um, we know that gut microbes contribute to host digestive efficiency um, and can produce extra energy and nutrients that the host might otherwise not be getting from their diet. And we also know that gut microbial communities shift in response to host diet. Um, so this is just an example of one study from humans. Um, we're looking at humans uh, consuming a high-fat, high-protein diet uh, compared to a high carbohydrate diet, and you can say, see that there's a change in the gut microbial community in which gut microbes are dominant depending on which diet these people are consuming. And we see lots of examples in the literature, especially the human literature, of these sorts of patterns across populations and also within individuals over time. So individuals that change their diet um, will also show shifts in their gut microbial communities, and this can happen overnight. Uh, so there's a lot of plasticity of the gut microbial community in response to host diet, and we know that when the gut microbes are shifting in terms of who's there in the gut, their functions are also shifting. So it's plausible uh, that these, these gut microbial communities can be changing in response to host diets, nutritional intake, for example. Their function may also be shifting, and perhaps that's helping uh, hosts deal with these diet shifts that they're undergoing. Now that being said, having a dynamic system may not always be a good thing. Uh, most of the time we're seeing shifts in these gut microbial communities that maintain this balance between microbes in the gut microbial community that are beneficial, neutral, and detrimental. And as long as these shifts maintain this balance, individuals tend to be okay. Um, but if you get a perturbation in the system that's large enough, say a diet change that's large enough, or a shift in host physiology, um, health status, something like that, uh, that's large enough, it can put this uh, system out of balance and you end up um, with maybe uh, fewer beneficial microbes and more detrimental and that can lead to other sorts of health problems in the host. So having a system that's so reactive to the host and its environment could be a good thing, but there also may be trade-offs associated with it. Um, and so kind of the major questions uh, that I want to use to frame the type of research I'm going to talk to you about today are, um, you know, does the gut microbiota buffer hosts against variation in nutritional intake and demands? Does it seem that the gut microbiota could be contributing to this kind of host dietary plasticity um, and, and nutritional plasticity? Um, if so, are there limits or trade-offs associated with this plasticity? And then ultimately, how do these mechanisms influence the fitness, ecology, and, and evolution of a species? And so the system I've done the most work in so far is uh, howler monkeys. Um, howler monkeys are a great model for looking at this sort of interaction between host and gut microbes. Uh, howler monkeys are found throughout Central and South America, um, and they have an extreme variability in their diet across seasons. So when there's fruit available um, in the forest that these howler monkeys inhabit, they will eat the fruit. They can have a diet of almost completely fruit, um, which is easy to digest, high in sugars, 
Um, but when the fruit becomes less available, these howler monkeys will switch their diet over to a diet of leaves and can consume almost completely leaves for several months of the year. And leaves are obviously a very different food resource than fruit. Um, they're high in these structural carbohydrates, plant secondary metabolites, much harder to digest. Um, and so for a long time, it's been assumed that howler monkeys rely very heavily on their gut microbial communities, um, but it's kind of been left at that. Um, so um, this is a perfect system to go in and look at are these gut microbial communities actually helping these howler monkeys in these different situations? Um, and I will mention, um, howler monkeys do not have um, a very specialized gut. Some of the other leaf-eating primates have a saculated fore stomach and a large cecum, and you don't see as extreme of the, um, morphological differences in these howler monkeys. So the gut microbes are really playing an important role here. Um, howler monkeys also tend to do relatively well compared to other primates um, in the face of anthropogenic habitat disturbance. So they'll persist for a longer amount of time in forest fragments um, with very different uh, plant uh, species structure uh, than other primates will. And so obviously when they're inhabiting these uh, you know, disturbed habitats, their diet is very different than it would be in kind of these um, less disturbed habitats. Um, so today I'm going to take you kind of through um, three different aspects of howler monkey uh, ecology and, and talk about how the gut microbial communities may be impacting the howler monkeys in these situations. Um, I'd really like to um, talk to you about how we can understand whether howler monkey gut microbes are affecting host plasticity um, across seasons as these howler monkey diets change across time, um, across life history stages. Uh, so females and juveniles presumably have increased nutritional demands from reproduction and growth. Um, do they have different gut microbial communities that are helping them meet meet those demands. Um, and then across habitats, so looking at howler monkeys that are in these disturbed habitats compared to the less disturbed types of habitats. Um, so I'll start by talking about these cross-seasonal patterns. Um, these data are data I collected uh, from howler monkeys in southeastern Mexico. Um, so I followed them two groups of uh, howler monkeys around for 10 months um, and sampled their gut microbial communities every two weeks. Um, and during that time, uh, there were three kind of main periods where the diets were very distinct. Um, so uh, these kind of acronyms are wet fruit dominated, dry leaf dominated, dry fruit dominated. Um, so basically different diets in different times of the year. And you can see, like I say, these howler monkeys go from consuming mostly fruits um, during one season uh, to mostly young leaves and then back to mostly fruits again. Um, so there are these dramatic shifts in the types of plants, uh, parts that are being consumed. Um, in terms of the actual nutritional content of the diet, there's also shifts, although the shifts don't happen exactly in parallel with the types of plant parts that are being consumed. Um, here instead you can see that as we move across these three seasons, there's a decrease in energy intake um, as well as the intake of things like um, non-structural carbohydrates, protein, and fiber. Um, so these diets are shifting quite dramatically over time. So what are the gut microbes doing? Could the gut microbes be playing a role in allowing the howler monkeys uh, to undergo these dramatic changes in their diet um, but still maintain their activity levels? Uh, these are the gut microbial data. I'm going to be showing you a lot of these plots today. These are ordination plots. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, um, you don't really need to worry about the axes. Um, but what you do need to worry about are the patterns of the points on the plot. So each point represents the gut microbial community of one howler monkey, and points that are closer together um, have uh, gut microbial communities that are more similar and farther apart are more distinct. Um, and so you can see very clearly here that there's clustering of these gut microbial communities depending on the season that I sampled the howler monkeys in. Their gut microbial communities are very different from season to season. Um, and this correlates very strongly with the changes in their diet. Um, if we do one of those Mantel tests that Seth was talking about, uh, you get very high values of correlation. Um, and what's interesting is when we go in and look at some of the microbes that are driving these patterns, um, there are actually shifts that are happening in parallel with the shifts in the diet as well. Um, so we had this decrease in energy intake um, across the seasons that I showed you in the previous slide. And you can see here that we also have a decrease in the relative abundance of Lactinosporaceae bacteria and an increase in the relative abundance of Ruminococcaceae. So you see there are these shifts happening, not only in the entire microbial community, but also in individual microbes that are happening in concert with these diet changes. Um, so what does this mean for the howler monkeys? Um, well, this is a wild system, so it's a little difficult to get at it. Um, but I measured the fecal short chain fatty acids. Remember, these are the compounds that hosts can use uh, for uh, absorb and use for energy. Um, and what I found was in this season where there was the lowest energy intake 
um, in the diet, there was actually the highest, significantly higher uh, amount of short chain fatty acids in the fecal material. Uh, so it looks like the gut microbial communities are actually producing more of these short chain fatty acids during those periods that the howler monkeys are consuming less energy. And on top of that, the activity budget of these howler monkeys was not changing dramatically across seasons. Um, there was a slight increase in resting time um, during this season. However, uh, that was really highly correlated with daytime temperatures and not necessarily food intake. Um, so it does not look like there's these changes in activity happening in response to diet. Instead, there's these changes in the gut microbial communities and potentially in the function of these gut microbial communities. Um, so in terms of uh, whether these gut microbial communities may be helping uh, howler monkeys uh, have this sort of dietary plasticity and compensate for changes across time, it looks like there is some evidence for this. Um, howler monkeys may be having these shifts in gut microbial communities across seasons that allow them to utilize these diets and still maintain activity levels. Um, so how about females and juveniles? Um, throughout all of these diet shifts and changes, females and juveniles are reproducing and growing. What about their gut microbes? Is there something different about them, perhaps? Um, is, or is there some other mechanism that uh, females and juveniles are using to compensate? Um, so to start off with, I want to show you that um, adult males, females, and juveniles really don't have a very different activity budget. Um, you see all these stars on this plot here when we're looking at the percent of time they're spending in each activity. But really what the difference is, is your juveniles, predictably so, are resting less and they're playing more. Um, so usually when you have the howler monkey adults resting, the juveniles are playing on top of them, um, which if the juveniles need more energy and nutrients uh, for growth, you would actually expect them to be doing the opposite. If they're using activity to compensate, you'd expect them to be less active, and that's not what's happening. Um, what about diet? Um, in terms of diet, there are some differences between adult males, adult females, and juveniles. Um, the females and the juveniles do tend to consume more energy um, per metabolic body rate and more protein. So there could be some compensation happening there in terms of the nutritional demands. Um, they tend to eat the same types of food for the same amount of time, uh, but they're eating, the females and the juveniles are eating those foods slightly faster than the males um, and therefore have a slightly higher intake of energy and protein. Um, but what about the gut microbial communities? Um, here's another one of these plots, and th this pattern is more subtle than the patterns we see across time. Um, but you can see here there's the juveniles clustering on this side of the plot um, and the adults on this side. And actually when I take a data set for which I didn't have diet data and I just add in um, more gut microbial community uh, data, there are significant differences between adult males and adult females as well. Um, so adult males, adult females, and juvenile howler monkeys have different gut microbial communities from each other. Um, and again, if we look at the bacteria or the microbes that are driving these patterns, uh, what's interesting is the juveniles tend to be characterized by Firmicutes bacteria compared to the adults. And we think that Firmicutes, based on uh, human studies of things like obesity, may be more efficient at producing energy. Um, so juveniles having more of these Firmicutes could actually be working in their favor um, in that they may be getting more energy out of their diets than adults potentially. Um, Adult females also have a higher firmicutes to bacteroidetes ratio. Again, more firmicutes, potentially higher energy production by these gut microbial communities. And interestingly, uh, females were also characterized by lactococcus. Um, and lactococcus has the ability to produce folic acid, uh, which is a really important vitamin for female reproduction. Uh, so this was an interesting microbe uh, to find in that female gut microbial community in higher prevalence and abundance. Um, Finally, the last thing I want to point out that I found very interesting is females tended to be characterized by more potential pathogens. Um, now, I don't have the type of resolution with this data set to tell you whether they're actually pathogens or not, uh, but these are genera that are associated uh, with pathogens in a variety of mammals, and females tend to have more of them. Um, so these shifts that are happening in terms of uh, potential increased energy production or vitamin production may also be sh shifting the gut microbial community uh, to make it uh, more susceptible to pathogens potentially. Um, so this may be one of those trade-offs um, of having this plastic sort of system. Um, in terms of the function, again, I measured these short chain volatile fatty acids in the fecal material, and here there were no differences between males, females, and juveniles in terms of the, the amount of these compounds in the fecal material. 
For males and females, this means that females may not necessarily be producing more energy with their gut microbial communities. There may be other benefits to the, to the differences in the gut microbial community. So things like maybe this folic acid production, potential folic acid production. Um, for juveniles, it's a different story though. Juveniles have a smaller body size and therefore a smaller gut. And so we would actually expect them to be producing fewer short chain fatty acids per gram of feces than the adults do. And so the fact that they're producing the same amount suggests that their gut microbial communities are actually uh, producing more energy than the adults are. Um, so in a few other interesting things is that um, there are consistent differences between males, females, and juveniles across time. So it does not matter what diet, what season I'm sampling in. Uh, these differences in the gut microbial communities were always apparent between males, females, and juveniles. So that suggests that the demands of reproduction and growth are always high, which makes sense. Juveniles tend to grow over a long period of time. Uh, female howler monkeys tend to be re reproducing, um, either pregnant or lactating, almost all of the time. Um, so their demands are always high. There may not be periods um, when the gut microbial communities can shift back to kind of normal again, because that just doesn't happen physiologically. Um, it also suggests that the diet that these howler monkeys is not affecting their strategy uh, for coping with nutritional demands, at least in terms of the gut microbial communities. It doesn't matter if the howler monkeys are consuming leaves or fruits, um, they always have these distinct gut microbial communities that are potentially helping them out. Um, and what was interesting is that although I showed you that there are some diet differences between adult males, females, and juveniles, um, the differences we see in the microbial communities were not correlated with diet. Um, there was a very, very weak relationship there. Um, so it suggests that something else is driving these differences between males, females, and juveniles. Um, and this isn't something I've had the time to test yet, um, but my first instinct would be hormones, um, especially uh, female reproductive hormones. Um, you have things like chorionic gonadotrophin and estriol, which are uh, altering the maternal immune system and progesterone, which can affect um, the transit of food and the absorption of micronutrients basically affect that gut environment. Um, both the immune system and the gut environment have an impact on gut microbial communities. Um, so it makes sense to me that these hormonal shifts would be shifting host physiology and shifting the gut microbial communities. Um, so again, some kind of preliminary evidence here that um, across life history stages, uh, adult female and juvenile howler monkeys uh, may have different types of microbes that are affecting their ability um, and maybe aiding their ability to um, have these increased nutritional demands regardless of what their diets are and allow them to not have huge changes in activity. Um, and so we see this sorts of comp uh, compensation across time and across space um, in terms of um, sorry, across time in terms of the, the seasonal shifts and in terms of these life history stages. What about across habitats? What happens when you disturb a habitat? Um, you're changing the types of diet that these howler monkeys are consuming. Can the gut microbes kind of step in and help the howler monkeys out in response to these habitat changes? Um, so this data set's slightly different. These are single time point samples um, from howler monkeys that were in uh, inhabiting a continuous evergreen rainforest, a continuous semi-deciduous forest, so this is where the, the, some of the leaves of the trees fall off during certain seasons of the year, um, a fragmented evergreen rainforest, and then some of uh, the howler monkeys in captivity. Um, and this captive uh, rehabilitation center was only a few kilometers away from the rest of the groups that were sampled in the wild. Um, and you can see very clearly on this plot that it does matter where the howler monkeys come from in terms of what their gut microbial communities look like. Um, you have very distinct gut microbial communities associated with the distinct habitats. Perhaps no surprise. Um, but are these differences, especially in frag uh, fragmented forests and perhaps captivity, are those differences helping the howler monkeys in these quote unquote less than ideal habitats? Um, the answer looks like it may be no. Uh, so we have this kind of gradient of habitat quality um, going from this kind of continuous less disturbed rainforest uh, towards a fragmented forest and captivity. And the diversity of these gut microbial communities is dropping as that habitat quality is dropping. Um, and like we think about in macroecology, uh, we think of uh, high diversity communities in the gut um, as being beneficial and low diversity uh, being associated with some risks. So you have losses in things like functional redundancy, uh, potentially uh, loss in uh, flexibility to respond to changes um, in the environment, uh, and perhaps also uh, reduction in resistance to invasion by gastrointestinal pathogens, things like that. Um, so this reduced gut microbial diversity in the howler monkeys may be having some health consequences for the howler monkeys in these fragmented forests. 
And when we look at the actual microbes that are shifting, again, there is an indication that these shifts in the gut microbial communities are not beneficial. Um, so there's a decrease in the relative abundance of uh, bacteria like Buterovibrio. Um, these are bacteria that produce those short chain fatty acids that provide energy for their hosts. And you're seeing less of those in these more disturbed habitats. And there's an increase um, in bacteria or microbes such as desulfovibrio. Um, and these types of microbes produce uh, what can be a toxic gas um, as a product of their metabolism. Um, and these compounds have been associated with things like colon cancer, irritable bowel, and other sorts of bowel inflammation um, in a lot of mammalian systems. Um, so again, looks like these shifts in the gut microbial community across habitats are not necessarily beneficial and instead may have some negative effects on the nutrition and the health of the hosts. Uh, so in terms of this kind of last point, I would say no, it does not look like the gut microbial communities um, are helping these howler monkeys to be more plastic in the face of habitat disturbance. Um, these mechanisms are happening across seasons and life history stages, um, but when you bring it to a certain point and start disturbing the habitat, those gut microbial communities aren't necessarily keeping up and can't compensate. Um, so kind of the last thing I want to touch on today is, are these patterns generalizable? All the data I've shown you um, are from one population of one species of primates. And so does the same thing happen um, if you look at other populations of the same primate, perhaps in different types of forests? Um, and does it happen in other species? And so some data I've been analyzing recently that I'll just show you briefly, um, take a step towards looking at whether these patterns are more generalizable. Um, I've been comparing these patterns um, in black howler monkeys, and these are the data that I've been showing you already. Black howler monkeys are the species that I've been talking about. Um, and I've been comparing them to patterns in mantled howler monkeys. Um, these two species are interesting. Uh, they're both located in Mexico um, and Central America. Um, except that the black howler monkey is endemic to Mexico, Guatemala, and Belize. Uh, you only find it in that area. Uh, whereas the mantled howler monkey is widespread, so you can find it from Mexico all the way down through Ecuador. Um, they have very similar diet, but distinct social systems as well. So there are some important differences between these two species, even though they're ostensibly very similar, and they're also very closely related in terms of their phylogenetic relationship. Um, and so I have data from black howler monkeys, um, both in this evergreen rainforest, which is where most of the data I've been showing you has come from, as well as the semi-deciduous forest across seasons and across habitats, so looking at primary versus secondary forest. And the same thing for the mantled howler monkeys, looking across seasons with those very different diets and looking across forest types, sorry, habitats within these different forest types. So I just want to show you this data briefly. Um, there's a lot of it, um, but there's just some main patterns I would like you to see. Um, so this half of the plot is that black howler monkey, um, kind of the data I've been talking about already. And then on this half of the plot is the mantled howler monkey. Um, and we have both rainforest and semi-deciduous dry forest for both species, and then primary and secondary forest, and then high fruit and low fruit seasons. Okay. Um, and so the, really the main pattern, this is diversity of the gut microbial community. You can see that the black howler monkeys have a reduction in gut microbial diversity when you move them from that primary less disturbed forest to the secondary disturbed forest. And that's the pattern I've already showed you. Okay, we see that again in this data set. Um, with the how black howler monkeys in the dry forest, you don't see that same pattern in diversity. There's not a change, but what you can see is that this black howler monkey already has reduced gut microbial diversity in the semi-deciduous forest. Um, so there's this big response of forest type um, in the black howler monkeys. Whereas the mantle howler monkeys, there's really no significant change in gut microbial diversity, no matter what forest type, what season, whether the habitat's disturbed or not, um, their gut microbial diversity remains about the same, uh, which is interesting. Um, and then in terms of the composition, these plots are really small, but I want you to see kind of the general patterns. Again, up here we have the black howler monkeys, and down here are the mantled howler monkeys, and then the rainforest and the semi-deciduous forest. You can see up here for the black howler monkeys in both types of forests, uh, there's an impact of habitat disturbance. So the black points are your primary forest, and the gray points are your secondary forest. Um, and you can see that there's this clustering pattern, very clear clustering pattern for both um, populations of black howler monkeys. Um, there's also a statistical effect of this habitat disturbance on the mantled howler monkey, but you can see on these plots um, that the pattern's not quite as clear, um, so the, the differences aren't quite as strong. Um, likewise, and this is uh, very difficult to see on here, but uh, you have uh, squares versus circles for showing your high fruit versus your low fruit season, and I'll just tell you there is an effective season in all of these populations. So it doesn't matter what population of howler monkey you're looking at, their gut microbial communities do shift with the season. 
Um, so I would argue that based on the, these data, um, kind of expanding the scope a little bit, it does look like the patterns are generalizable to some extent. So season does always have an effect on the gut microbial communities of these howler monkeys, no matter what species you're looking at of these two species, um, or looking at what population you're looking at. Um, and there's also an impact of habitat. However, that impact of habitat may vary depending on the species. Um, you get more of an impact on microbial diversity in the black howler monkeys and that endemic species, and um, slightly more of an impact uh, on the composition of the gut microbial community when you're shifting uh, their habitats and disturbing them. Um, so again, I would say these patterns hold up when we start to expand our scope to some extent. Um, so for at least for these two species of howler monkeys, uh, there is some evidence that there is this sort of uh, shifting in the gut microbial community across seasons um, and across habitats uh, that may be helping the howler monkeys in some cases and may not be helping the howler monkeys in other cases. Um, so kind of back to these major questions, um, does the gut microbiota buffer hosts against variation in nutritional intake and demands? Um, this is kind of a preliminary look at things that could be happening in these wild systems, but I would say yes, there's some evidence that this may be happening, and there's definitely things we need to go back and measure and start to integrate things like fitness measures into that, um, but there's evidence that this sort of relationship is happening. Um, are there limits or trade-offs? Again, I would say yes. Um, trade-offs, for example, we see the females that have distinct gut microbial communities that may be nutritionally beneficial, uh, but may open them up to more invasion by pathogens. Um, so maybe you don't always necessarily want that high energy producing, high vit uh, vitamin producing gut microbial community because there may be risks that are associated with that. Um, and limits, I would say, were very clear when we look at habitat disturbance. Um, so if you shift the howler monkey diet across time, the gut microbial community looks like it can shift in response to that and, and potentially buffer um, these howler monkeys uh, against nutritional um, kind of consequences. Uh, but if you change that diet enough by disturbing the habitat, gut microbial communities can no longer respond. So there's a limit um, to kind of this flexibility or plasticity that they help the hosts with. Um, and this last question, how do these mechanisms influence fitness, ecology, and evolution of a species? Um, I think that looking at these types of data helps set us up to be able to ask these questions and get data that more directly address them. But I would say even just based on this kind of preliminary look at this wild population, um, there are some hypotheses we can make. Um, so in terms of fitness, um, you know, having these gut microbial communities that allow you to use different diets uh, without changing activity or allow you to reproduce during periods of low food availability um, would potentially have a huge impact on fitness. And we need to go out and start to measure, are there actually these differences in fitness that we can detect in these wild populations in individuals that have different types of gut microbial communities? Um, in terms of the black howler monkey versus the mantled howler monkey, I also think it's interesting to think about how this endemic species that potentially has uh, limited habitat flexibility um, may be more affected by habitat changes in terms of the gut microbiota than that more widespread species. Um, even though they have a lot of ecological similarities, there may be differences in the gut microbial communities that are impacting these howler monkeys and perhaps ultimately impacting their distribution patterns um, across a larger geographical region. Um, so these are really interesting questions that I think we need to start to um, address more directly. And I think looking at these in the field, although it's messy, is very, very interesting. And it's going to be a really important step for us to start to integrate these gut microbial communities and some of their functions and mechanisms into models such as those of bioenergetics and understanding the ecology of these species in the wild. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank the funding, funding agencies that um, helped with this work, mostly dissertation work, um, as well as the permitting uh, agencies in Mexico and Nicaragua, where I personally did the field work, um, as well as a variety of people, um, particularly uh, Paul Garber, my PhD advisor, and Rob Knight and Steve Lee, my postdoc advisors, um, the rest of my PhD committee, um, people that helped with field collection of samples in Mexico, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica, um, as well as people that helped with lab processing of samples. And I'd be happy to take questions. That's 
possible. Um, so I often get the question, you know, do our gut microbial communities decide what we eat um, without us knowing? Um, and I think that's definitely possible. I don't think we know enough about the gut-brain kind of interaction with microbes at this point to, do, to be able to tell. Um, what I do know is that juveniles in, in most primates, not only howler monkeys, are learning what to eat right from, from their moms um, for the most part. Um, and these juveniles uh, start eating kind of uh, an adult diet very early on, um, almost immediately as they start to eat these um, uh, solid foods and are, are not nursing anymore. Um, so there may be kind of a, a I suppose that there's a possible effect um, on the cognition um, and there also may be this kind of socially learned um, feeding behavior that impacts what uh, types of gut microbial communities are being formed because of that diet. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, in that same question you sort of alluded to the ability to test fitness differences and how they relate to the gut microbiome in the field. Is that, is that something you've thought about in terms of what the experiments would look like or is that still an idea at this point? Um, so a little bit of both. Test in the field is probably a strong way to put it, right? Because as you've shown <laughs> or mentioned, um, it's hard to test things in the field, especially with primates. There's not a whole lot of manipulation I can do there. Um, so kind of the two things that um, I'd like to look at first are long-term studies of primate populations. Um, that doesn't exist, well, it's starting to exist for this black howler monkey population, um, but there are uh, studies of things like baboons that have been going on for years and years where they have demographic data and you can actually look at reproductive output. Um, and so putting those sorts of data together with gut microbial data um, to understand um, what are kind of the variables at play. Now, granted, I can't control all of the variables that will be influencing fitness, but starting to put that data together. Um, and I've also thought a little bit about, um, again, this would not be ideal in my opinion, but doing uh, fecal transplants into some of these notobiotic systems um, to see if there are differences. Um, you know, granted, we're looking at a new host and we're not in the wild anymore, um, but are there impacts of these shifts in the microbial communities um, when you look at it experimentally? Um, those would be my two approaches to that question. <laughs> yeah. So maybe you're thinking of transplants to a good end of question uh, if you're thinking so that route. But we know that animals are going through a bunch of different physiological changes with the <coughs> And so you mentioned that this may be true in the microbial community that they're acting as, or you're interpreting it as they're acting as receptors. But how is it that you see the part? Does there Yeah, so if you wanted to get it experimentally, again, transplants are probably the best way to do that. Again, you, you know, I'm not going to have notobiotic mice that are eating fig fruits. Um, that's not going to happen. Um, but looking at, um, you know, if you shift that diet, um, does kind of a certain gut microbial community deal better with those shifts um, from high fiber to low fiber than others? Um, what I think is also an important aspect, which, um, you know, there's only so many things you can measure at once in a given study, especially when you're chasing monkeys around. Um, but Looking at uh, more direct measures of um, host physiology and then at the function of the gut microbial community. So things that I think would be relatively easy to integrate and important um, would be doing things like um, looking at shotgun data. So looking at the functional genes of these gut microbial communities um, to understand, you know, okay, there's different types of microbes. Are there actually different genes um, that are either there and can potentially be used or that are being actually expressed during those different seasons and are those related to the diet? Um, and then also looking at um, host physiological status. So um, a lot of primatologists will measure things uh, like C-peptide levels in the urine and that can be used as a proxy for host nutritional status. Um, so looking at um, during certain seasons, do certain um, monkeys with different microbial communities um, have kind of less of a change in their nutritional status than others? Um, so again, I would kind of take that dual approach of collecting more data that's actually looking at the nutrition and health status of the host in the wild, and then you could try to test it with some of these transplants. But again, you're a very different system when you're transplanting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Versus things that they're already filtering without changing 
Yeah, great question. Um, I have not profiled the food sources. Um, I will say that based on the data, what you are getting is generally a shift in the relative abundance of these microbes, um, not necessarily new microbes that are appearing. Um, and kind of on top of that, in terms of microbes that are associated with food, uh, very few of those are actually going to make it um, down to the hindgut. Um, and we're sampling fecal samples here, so these are looking at, at a proxy for the hindgut, right? Um, very few of those, you know, a microbe that's living on a leaf um, in the open air is not necessarily the type of microbe that's going to survive in the anaerobic gut. And all those microbes have to make it through the acid stomach and all that first. Um, so I think the input from food is going to be pretty low. Yeah? How many seasons do you go through to determine this? This was one year. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm sure there's interannual variability as well, um, but this was a uh, one year, so, so 10 months. Um, each season was about three months long, um, and I split those seasons based on diet changes I recorded. Not to give you my influence here, uh, uh, drought versus dr uh, wet years on the plant material. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that kind of interannual variability absolutely plays a role. You may see more dramatic changes during a drier year versus a wetter year um, if there's more dramatic changes. Are there records on weather patterns and dry droughts versus wet years in the history that maybe somebody has already looked at some of mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I would say this was a, a pretty typical year. I wouldn't say it was extremely dry or wet um, the year that I was there, but those data do exist. Mm -hmm. Thank you, done? Yeah. Thanks.